you know, I think the most remarkable thing about the markets is we had like such a huge run up last year and you would think that the Wall Street analysts would get like wildly bullish. But I feel like if anything, there's just like a lot of skepticism out there like, hey, OK, I get it. The economy didn't fall off a cliff last year, but uh, this has to be like a one off fluke that the market was up as big as it was. So I really feel like it's kind of a cautionary environment right now. Well, they they their hardliners have been wrong three years in a row. You don't think it's going to be four years in a row? <laughs> Broken clock is right uh, twice a day. Chris told me once, um, but you know I think Bob, you've been using this quote a lot. But Sir John Templeton once said that bull markets are born on pessimism, and I think we had pessimism last year. They grow on skepticism, um, and I think that's where we're at right now. Right, you've got skepticism which probably bodes well, even though the markets are down a little bit here as, a, as we are starting the year. Well, you know, it's funny. I'm talking to my clients and doing everybody's annual review. Um, you know, even with the market ramping up so much, everybody still has so much money in cash and they just can't get off that ledge of like, hey, I'm getting four or 5% in my money market. You know, it's just, it's like the hardest sell in the world to try and convince them that that's not going to last. Yeah, but Chris, it's a guarantee that you won't make a better return. <laughs> <laughs> you know, we all know we like guarantees, you know, you get those with uh, money markets and annuities, right? Well, I think we got to we got to take a page out of Courtney's playbook. Uh, you know, Courtney was back from maternity leave. We missed you, Court. Is she literally left in the summertime when the market was up. You know, market obviously plummeted, went down like over 10 percent, then rebounded heavily in December, magically when Courtney came back. So it's like, basically, Court, you were away. It's almost like nothing happened when you got back. <laughs> no, really, the markets were just happy here. I was coming back. That's actually why they were covered, just in case you were wondering. <laughs> Courtney, you're now one of our major indicators. So uh, That's right. let me know when you're going on maternity leave again. I got well, I think, I, I, I think baby Gianna will be a great market timer just based on when she was born. <laughs> I agree. <laughs> Brian, I think you're exactly right. It's kind of fascinating because right now what you're seeing is investor sentiment levels are actually showing they're overly optimistic right now. But people aren't actually putting their money where their mouth is there because you're seeing, to Chris's point, cash levels are really high. We're definitely seeing this with our own clients. But when you look at the overall picture of the economy, cash levels are getting close to $6 trillion. People are just are not being enticed by the idea that interest rates are likely going to come down. And money markets are not a good place to have, that, have your funds because that's the first thing that's going to adjust downwards are money market funds because they're a floating rate. And that's why you want to make sure you're a little more forward thinking with your money. So whether you're doing something short term like a treasury, but locking in a little bit longer than the immediate money market rates you're seeing, or you're investing your money for the future, it's a really good time to look at that because these rates probably aren't going to last forever. Well, it kind of reminds me of the movie Austin Powers. I don't know if you remember this. There's a scene where this bulldozer is ready to go and he's ready to hit <laughs> Austin Powers, but it's so far away. He knows it's coming and he just keeps screaming, but he stays there. And that's kind of like what's with interest rates right now. Like we know the Fed's going to cut rates this year. The odds are extremely high, yet you get the kind of uh, inertia with money, right? Investors don't want to move their money because they're getting their 5% right now. But we know with a lot of clarity that's going away, which just speaks to just like last year, you're better off making a move, being proactive and getting your money invested as opposed to sitting in cash. And I think investors are going to make that same mistake again this year. So paralysis by fear is not a good strategy here, Rye? <laughs> not in my playbook, Chris, but you know, yeah. that's just me. Well, not everybody can be as bold as you, Rye. You said it. I didn't want to say it. So thank you. <laughs> you, know, you guys, I've gone through my whole career, you know, believing that the, uh, the government gets things correct on things like the CPI, you know, only to find out that, you know, we have this uh, artificial number, right? Like, what could homeowners rent their house for if they were actually going to rent their home? Like, you know, um, and, and meanwhile, you know, we're looking at real world data, right? You look at the apartment list, you know, measure of court, uh, uh, you know, core numbers right now. It shows, you know, rental inflation isn't inflating. It's actually declining. And the Fed is so far behind on that. So if you take that number out, you take these shelter numbers that, you know, really smart economists like Jeremy Siegel and Ed Jardini recognize. You know, the Fed's already at their target, you know, not the end of this year, the end of the next year. They're there already in terms of inflation. So, you know, when these these hardliners, these pessimists, these perma bears keep telling us, well, now the rates, you know, the Fed's not going to drop rates. Why do they raise them so many times if they're if they're now just going to turn around and drop them? <laughs> you know, it's like, well, because they won. Um, you know, that might be one reason. And, you know, and there's an election year. That might be another reason. Right, we're getting into the silly season, so um, yeah, it's pretty pretty amazing. Um, 
But again, people people wait till the bell rings, till the flag waves, and all of a sudden it's like, wow, how, how did prices get to be so high? Did I, did I miss the move? What happened? You know, I got to say, Dad, I, I think, you know, really we're looking at this the wrong way. We should We should be grateful to those pessimists because they're so willing to give those shares away at such cheap prices. You know, for those of us that uh, aren't paralyzed by fear, like Ryan, you know, the, the bowl, yep. you know, they're giving us great shares at great prices. And, uh, you know, that's only going to benefit us in the long run. So thank you to the pessimists. Last week was a great example, right? We had the CPI came in, you know, hot, right? One tenth higher than anticipated and everybody's hair was on fire. And then the next day, PPI came in, you know, and it, it was down as expected, or it actually wasn't even expected. But what's the difference, right? PPI doesn't have that shelter index in there. It's not reflected, you know, in PPI. So clearly the trend is down. And remember, markets don't care if things are good or bad. They only care if things are getting better or worse. And clearly on the inflation front, since we hit that 9.1% number, it's getting better. You know, Court, you're on, I watch on CNBC every week. It's the only time I get to see you nowadays. Um, <laughs> so we're, we're honored that you could... Uh, find time for the podcast, but like, what's the sentiment that you're seeing? I know you go on TV, you're relatively optimistic, which is always rare. Um, but what's the consensus out there? I mean, what, what kind of conversations are you having and, and what are you seeing in terms of what the viewpoint is or the consensus viewpoint is? You know, Ryan, I think what's interesting is we really get a lot of our insights directly from our clients, right? I mean, it doesn't really matter all the analysts we talk to because it's, it's pretty interesting, but oftentimes the analysts are wrong. And even right now, they're forecasting that this year there might be a 2% growth rate. Last year, they said, okay, maybe it's going to be about 6% the markets are up. And they were up, what? 18% if I remember correctly. <laughs> yeah, just to move by like 18%. <laughs> so I don't think it matters so much what any of the talking heads are going to think that's mm. going to happen. I think where it really matters is that you have your money invested. And you're right. Clients are definitely still nervous right now. I, I'm talking to clients every single day. We have too much cash. We're still nervous about where things are heading. The elections definitely tend to make people nervous. But I actually continue to remain optimistic that the economy is on good footing, inflation's coming down. Election years actually tend to be a good thing for the stock markets. Really, I think all the reasons people are nervous about, I don't think there's a lot of bearing there that, that should prevent you from putting your money invested for a long-term strategy. And I think that's really what you need to focus on as an investor. And that's what we're talking to people about every day right now. Yeah, it is. And you know, Bob just made a good point saying like, you know, waiting for that all clear signal. Well, I think you get it right now. We're actually getting a little bit of a sell-off in the market. Mm -hmm. Like you start looking at different asset classes that aren't the S and P 500, which is basically seven stocks. But I digress. But you know, you look at like the Vanguard REIT index right now it pays four percent, and that dividend is going to increase over time. Whereas you lock into a four percent treasury, you know, you're stuck with that four percent for ten years. So you know, you're getting a little bit of a sell off. You know, dividend yields, and we know too, we work with a lot of baby boomers. Uh, they need cash flow. Um, and you can't just buy those tech stocks to get cash flow. And again, if you're sitting in cash, that yield's going away. So it's a great time to get into the market, uh, stock market or bond market, to lock into some yields right now that are really attractive for the long term. I mean, you can really lock it in right now. So it's kind of like you haven't missed the opportunity, but I feel like a lot of investors feel like they have missed that opportunity. Oh, wait. And by the way, what is the yield on the Magnificent 7? 0.19%. Uh, for the right one nine percent. Oh, that's awesome. Oh wait, no, it's not. Yeah, but you know what, guys? If you really, if you look at uh, like on my last last week's market commentary, you know, the S P five hundred briefly just brushed the all time record high that it set two years ago, and you know, two years seems like an eternity. So a lot of investors are looking at, well, you know, my portfolio was at an all time record high two years ago, and they forget that they started investing twenty or thirty years ago. So like your millions, 10 million now. Uh, no, no, no. I was at 10 million three and now I'm only at 10 million two. <laughs> I'm losing. Um, so it's, it's just that, that I think that's uh, that overhang, you know, like, I think investors mentally need to see, you know, those new highs happen. Now, you know, I look at the advanced decline lines. I look at the global markets, um, you know, I look at the advanced decline lines on all the stocks that are publicly traded. We're in a big booming bull market. It started in 2013. It's a secular bull market, um, and it's just amazing how afraid you become um, because of you know your your recent hindsight. Remember, uh, past performance is not as predictive of past performance. That's all it tells you. But everyone projects the future based on most recent experience, and I can see why the average investor, everybody, yeah, everybody, you know, everybody's an average normal human being. I've never met anybody exceptional except for people paying capital, but. Um, you know, we tend to project the future based on our most recent experience. 
And that's what people are looking at. They're afraid that we're going to go through that another year and a half or two years of uh, consolidation. It's not going to do that. Well, you know what the interesting part about it was, and I, I polled a lot of my clients about this, especially in, in 2022. And I said, well, you know, based on what's happening in the market, you know, what exactly has changed about your lifestyle? You know, what, what have you changed in your life just based on what the market's doing? And the predominant response was nothing. My life is the same. Yeah, but Chris, you don't understand. Things are really bad. Um, <laughs> you know, how many times we've had that conversation? It's like, I miss the good old days. Like, like really where? When? Yeah. <laughs> what was good about the good old days, right? Um, you know, you didn't have your cell phone. You didn't have 18,000 streaming channels to watch and entertain yourself. You, you know, you didn't have the convenience of traveling all over the world. Tell me about those good old days again. What about March of 2020, those good old days? Well, we were reading that book about the wager, that, uh, oh. That, oh. That, that vessel, that man of war sailing vessel from the 1700s. And man, if you're on that getting scurvy with your teeth falling out, <laughs> starvation, I miss the good old days too. <laughs> uh, yeah. Yeah. You know, you, you get to sleep every night on the ship with rats and, and, and uh, mice and oh, woodworms. <laughs> and little, little, uh, little fun fact. I know how Ryan loves my sailing stories. Uh, the reason that they call, they call them limeys is because scurvy was a lack of vitamin C and they used to chew on limes to cure it. So that's where the term limey comes from. Pretty amazed that they, that's all they had to do, Chris. Right. Yep. Yeah. You imagine what the diet was salted beef and pork, right. With a, yep. You know, a little bit of rum every once in a while, if you're lucky. Yeah, and something called hardtack, which hard sounds tack. great. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> I was the come full circle. It's better now than it was in the past. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Court, what do you see here for the future? What's your uh, what's your sage advice here to start off and kick off the uh, the new year here on on Pain Points of Wealth podcast? Yeah, we had a really good end of last year. Basically, markets bottomed the end of October, and they had a really good run up through the end of December. Um, and markets have um, consolidated a little bit here, which I think is normal after having such a good run. But I think things are really well positioned here for 2024. So I think it's a really good time. Take a look at your finances. Make sure everything is set up. Also, it's a really good time to rebalance. I can't tell you how many people look in their accounts right now. And if you haven't changed anything, what's happened is you probably have now too much in those big tech companies because that's what had all the growth last year and not enough in some of your interest rate sensitive sectors like small caps or real estate or energy. Um, so it's just a really good time to rebalance your portfolio, focus on your long-term goals, but just position yourself that if this is in fact a good year, like we hope it is, that you're positioned to take advantage of that. Hey, hope you're enjoying episode 145, Pain Points of Wealth. Hard to believe we've had that many episodes. If you like our podcast, love our podcast, and think to yourself, I need a more hands-on approach. I need someone to look over my finances. With our collective 75 years of experience, Bob, Chris, and I can run for you our total financial master plan if you saved over a million dollars for your financial future, we'll do a full financial review where we literally look at everything. We'll go as far as building you your own personalized financial portal. We'll give you a bird's eye view of your entire financial life and we'll hone in on every financial issue you need to address today. There's not a firm out there that will do this work up front. We'll help you build an income plan for retirement. How do you take Social Security? Well, there's lots of ways to take it. One right way for you. How do you pull from your portfolio without running out of money? We'll build a dynamic income plan. We'll show you how to diversify your portfolio properly. Are you sitting with way too much money in cash, paralysis by analysis, trying to figure out what to do? Or has your portfolio been a yo-yo up and down every year? Can't really figure out if you're making progress or not. We'll put together a full investment game plan. We'll show you how to grow your wealth, but most importantly, protect it over the rest of your life, tied to your goals, and we'll look at fees and taxes. Wall Street loves to sell you those high cost, tax inefficient products, whether they're annuities, mutual funds, brokerage products, structured products. We'll do a deep dive of every investment you own. We'll show you how to reduce the cost on your portfolio, optimize it for taxes. It's not what you make, it's what you take. We'll give you our full tax playbook. If you want this full holistic review, you saved over a million dollars for your financial independence plan. Simply go to www.paincm.com slash financial plan to see if you qualify for a free financial review. All right, it's the tipping point. This is where we pinpoint the pain point, of course, that's P-A-Y-N-E, having the biggest impact on your wealth right now. So Bob, Chris, and Courtney, you know, give us the beginning of the year. What better time to review your assets and make sure you're on track to achieve all your financial goals than, well, now? So I thought we could discuss the three most important questions you really should be asking your financial professional to make sure that you've got the right financial game plan for 2024 and beyond. And I think the one question we get all the time is, can I live off my assets when I want to? 
everyone wants to know they're not going to run out of money. Well, I think the answer to that is, is yes, you can. Um, you know, like if you want to start living off your assets today, yes, I guess you could, but you probably would run out of money. Um, the, the better answer is you should probably do some kind of a financial plan first. Go through what your income is, what you're saving, um, how much you put away already, and then set a target date in the future of when you think you want to live off those assets. So it's always good to make sure uh, that you plan it out, not just pick a date in the future or random date in the future. I'm just hoping my brother's going to be rich and he's going to send me a check every month. But, you know, that's my plan. I've been sending checks every month. You just haven't been cashing them. <laughs> Maybe you got the wrong address. You got to get to the mailbox once in a while. <laughs> well, I think one of the things that um, actually we should do a future podcast on this. Uh, a friend of mine was asking me the other day, he said, why, why don't you discuss what an uh, entrepreneur has to go through uh, to decide to retire? Right. Because what's what's the biggest fear of uh, retiring? Running out of money. Out of money. Yeah. So it's like, you know, one day you're, you're you're collecting that cash flow. Right. And all of a sudden you have to live off your assets. That's a big leap you know, for a lot of folks. But I think the, um, I think the most important decision that every, every investor seems to make, or at least the question they have when they first come to us is, yeah, I love my job. I love my company. I love my boss. Or I, you know, I love what I do. Um, but it gets harder and harder every day because, you know, some clients and some customers aren't as nice as they used to be, or some suppliers and, you know, business is tough, right? What business isn't tough? All business is tough. What if I just wanted to chuck it all tomorrow? You know, can I? Do I have that big go to hell money? Do I have enough to just walk out the door? Um, I need to know, you know, before I insult my boss tomorrow at work. All right. <laughs> so it's, uh, I think that's a really big question in the minds of a lot of people. Don't you guys? Yeah, definitely. And, you know, we really don't talk so much about retirement at this point, more about financial independence. You made that good point. You know, that, that day that you feel, feel comfortable going to work and saying, you know what? I don't want to put up with this anymore. And there's a lot that goes into this because I have clients who always build their own spreadsheets. They come to us and say, you know, I think my money will last throughout my lifetime. Can you just confirm that this is accurate? Um, we actually have software that goes a lot more in depth because you have to factor in some things like, for example, inflation. Every year, it's going to actually cost more to live. So maybe you need, I'm just throwing out a number, $100,000 to live off of currently. You're going to be surprised how much more that is 10, 20 years from now. And you need to make sure that your money is growing with that. And there's also things like taxes. So for example, maybe you've done a really good job saving in your 401k. Every time you take money out, you're going to owe taxes on that. And you're only going to get the net amount of that. And so you need to factor in all of these different um, topics, which we do for all of our clients. We build this and make sure we go in depth as possible. Um, and that's really just something that it's good to do at least once a year on our portfolio. We're in the new year. It's just a good reminder. Um, take a look at that and make sure that you're getting your projections updated as well. And nothing drives me crazier than those like simple calculators online. And you're right, Courtney. I think, you know, you and I have been a couple of meetings where people come in where they ran the numbers and it's just so simplistic. And I think, you know, when I think about when we do these meetings, they're kind of intense. They're kind of like mental gymnastics because we're sitting there, we're asking questions about, okay, when do you want to retire? To your point, Courtney, like what kind of accounts do you have? Are they retirement accounts? Are they after-tax accounts? Um, you know, it, there's just so many different inputs that you're putting in and it, it really, like when I do a meeting like that, I'm actually drained at the end of the meeting <laughs> because there's so many numbers, but it's so therapeutic to do it. Um, but I think it's so important that if, you know, if you have an advisor professional that you're sitting down and you're doing that hard work up front, because once you do that hard work up front and you kind of build that like baseline, then you can play with it from there. Then you can really decide what the asset allocation is from there, how you should invest your money. But until you do that first step and really get that baseline or that blueprint of where you are and what you're trying to achieve, you really can't do much. You're just putting the carpet before the horse. And that's what our industry does, right? They just love to sell you products and not take the time to do the mental gymnastics. But you need to do those mental gymnastics. It's critical. Well, you know what, Ryan? You made a really good point talking about, um, you know, those online calculators. You know, if you go on to like your, your Vanguard 401k, it says, well, you're, you're going to need this much in retirement. Well, they don't have a sense of what you make what you spend. And, you know, frankly, most people out there don't have a sense of what they spend. I mean, it, so many times when I go in these reviews, you know, the, the, the person thinks they spend, you know, say $5,000 a month, but after we're done, you know, it turns out it's more like seven or 8,000 a month. And, you know, I always get the same comment. Well, I don't spend that every month. Well, that doesn't include vacations or going out to dinner. You know, I don't include that stuff. Well, you know, that's part of what you spend. I noticed there wasn't a tab on that uh, calculator that says inheriting all your brother's money. 
So for me, it doesn't work at all. So well, I just changed Courtney to my primary beneficiary. So sorry, guys, you're not getting anything. Well, she's a lot nicer. Let's be honest. <laughs> that, I, I don't think anybody will disagree with that. Uh, hey guys, you know I had that, that that one stint in my career where I was trying to help the competition, you know, to um, to increase their productivity and become more consultative in their processes. And you know, every single time. We, we have a new client on board that comes from one of the major wirehouses. And you say, well, you know, the, wow, this is great work, guys. This is, you know, really, really feel good. I'm comfortable that the projections look great. We're saying, well, didn't the other firm run these for you? And say, well, you know, they have this kind of like compliance blenderized software, which I never trusted. And, and you know, they, they didn't seem to put a lot of effort into the planning. Um, they weren't certified financial planners. They weren't fiduciaries. And, you know, I'm sure that they ran it, but, you know, I'm not going to trust it. You know, I'm going to trust this, right? This is a process. Like, court, like you said, we have very sophisticated software, the best of the industry. And, and you know, Chris, I've been in so many meetings with you where, you know, hey, we're going to try and make it fail. All right. We're going to make, we're going to try and, and, and stress the living daylights out of this so you can sleep well at night. You know, it's almost like um, I told a friend of mine the other day and they said that the, the job of their admissions committee at their country club is to not admit anybody. So we're like, you know, we're not going to admit you into the retirement hall of fame. Um, you know, we're going to, we're going to beat you up pretty good. So we want references. We want data. We want proof. Um, and I think that's the key. And it's just like, there's nothing more comfortable, more comforting, you know, than running those projections and saying, wow, you know, you've been following the plan for 10 years, 15 years. You cannot live your money. Way to go. You know, it's like it's a it's a mutual pat on the back, right? You, we did a good job of planning. They did a je- good job of following instruction. Yeah, exactly. And, you know, you made a, a really good point there, Dad. You know, it's kind of like when you go to get your physical, you know, they do a stress test, right? They're trying to see where you are realistically. You know, they're not trying to sugarcoat it and say, oh, you know, yeah, your cholesterol is high, but go ahead and keep eating those donuts. You know, it's like you and I did a review for a prospective client last week. And he was telling us about the review they did at his previous firm. They were using 8 to 10% for his average rate of return over his lifetime. I mean, that's just unrealistic. You know, you've really got to put the, put the screws to your portfolio and your financial plan and really test it if it's going to work. The other, the other big issue that I see um, is, and Court, I know you can attest to this too, because you and I run a lot of proposals together, is a lot of times you just don't know what you're paying and you get sticker shock. Uh, when you find out what actual the actual fees are, and I know we built a spreadsheet that goes pretty in depth, but a lot of times it's the devil you don't see, not the devil you do uh, when it comes to your investments. Like a lot of the fees are embedded in the portfolio. Exactly right. Yeah. And I find that um, especially some people might do their investments on their own and they're aware that, okay, maybe I don't really want to pay an advisor. I can do this. I've been doing it great for the last 10 years. Um, but it's actually shocking because what we do with a lot of our clients is we, well, all of our clients is we actually pull out the fees that you're paying. So any fund that you ever own has an embedded cost to it. It's there, you know, those thick prospectuses they send you in the mail. If you want to go through those, you can see them. Um, Just to make it simpler, we break it out for you. So we make it very transparent. Um, But I can't tell you how many people are currently not paying an advisor, yet they're paying higher fees than working directly with an advisor who will use lower cost products. So you're paying the same amount, if not less at the end of the day, but you're actually paying somebody who's actively giving you advice and planning for you rather than paying for these embedded fees, which are in these funds that you own and essentially just takes away from your return over time. So pay for the planning, not for the fund. The fund that's like more expensive doesn't tend to outperform. And I think that's really good to keep in mind. And that's why it's such an amazing industry because you tend to pay more to get less service and advice and underperform. <laughs> it's usually high correlation between <laughs> higher fees and less service and less performance. Um, so you got to find that middle ground to your point where you're paying a professional a reasonable amount um, to use low cost products, ideally, because we know money managers with their extra fees end up underperforming. <laughs> and statistically, it's like almost 90 percent. You know, I'm not a gambler, but man, oh, man, if my odds are like 90 percent, I'm going to underperform by using a manager. Why would I ever use a manager? Yet the mutual fund industry is still alive and well. It's just like blows my mind. Um, and I think just people, the inertia of money, don't realize just how badly you get treated. And you don't even know you're getting treated badly. Hey, guys, they made a movie about the uh, wirehouse brokers and the money center bank brokers. It's called The Day the Earth Stood Still. <laughs> <You know? laughs> they, they give you one one good meeting. They put your, your portfolio to work, and then you never hear from them again.
All right, it's the Hidden Facts of Finance. Random financial facts that may surprise you or even maybe shock you. All right, this first one's for Bob. Bob, the dividend champ of all the publicly traded companies, there's only one with 69 straight years of dividend increases. It's called American States Water, which I've never heard of, a smallish California utility worth about $3 billion that supplies water to 80 communities in the state. American States Water stock has excellent long-term track record with an annualized return of 12.5% a year since 1988 versus 10.8% a year for the S&P 500. An impressive showing for a low-risk utility. Just as a comparison, Coca-Cola's raised their dividend 61 straight years in a row. But man, oh man, that's phenomenal. Yeah, it's up there with uh, all the other dividend aristocrats, as we call them, right? Procter & Gamble, uh, Emerson Electric, Dover, Genuine Parts have all increased their dividend, not 67 years in a row, 67 consecutive years, right? They have to increase their dividend every single year in order to stay on that list. But nonetheless, I wouldn't put it. I wouldn't throw a dart at the board. Just pick one. I would own a broad index of dividend-paying stocks, like a large company value portfolio. This way, you hedge your risk. Your capitalization-weighted index. You're going to end up with the winners. I don't need to know who they are ahead of time. I just need to have hindsight and tell you, hey, we did really well picking that investment because we had all the winners in the portfolio. I'll let you know what they are next year, guys. <laughs> Bob is always playing Monday morning quarterback, uh, but it's kind of fascinating because a lot of people now, and I had this conversation with a friend who totally believes that tech stocks and growth stocks outperform over time. They did the last 10 years, but longer term, they don't actually outperform. They underperform. And a lot of that is because they don't pay a lot of dividends. And Chris, you mentioned that earlier, the, the mega cap seven pays very little in dividends. We're really over the longer term reality. That's where the majority of your return comes from. So it's a good time to spread that money out, get some dividend paying stocks in your portfolio. That's a really good point, Rye. I had a conversation with a client the other day and we, um, we, we needed to raise some money for his RMD. So we took a profit on our large cap growth portfolio, which is up 46%. He said, that's, that's excellent, Bob. That's wonderful. And I said, yeah, but we were down 33% in the same investment the year before. He goes, oh, <laughs> that's not a great average. I said, yeah, you know what a great average was? Our pipeline index was up you know, 16% last year, and it was up 22% this year. That way outperformed large growth, but nobody ever bangs on my door saying, hey, give me more pipelines. I want some more AI, yeah. buddy. Yeah, but I'd love a little more uh, NVIDIA, please. All right, Chris, uh, BYD overtook Tesla to become the world's biggest electric car company in the final quarter of 2023. The Chinese company sold a record 525,000 battery electric vehicles as a comparison, Tesla delivered 484,507 in the same period. However, over the entire year, Tesla still outpaced BYD selling 1.8 million electric vehicles versus BYD's 1.57 million electric vehicles, still up 73%. So the EV market is growing in China is the biggest contender. Well, it's kind of curious that these BYD cars look mysteriously like a lot like the Tesla on both the exterior <laughs> And the interior, and uh, I'd imagine there's a, probably a lot of similar technology. You know, China's really good at uh, the old adage that great artists steal. Um, you know, Tesla did a great job marketing the electric car, and now China's got a car that looks uh, remarkably similar. Hmm. I don't think it's a coincidence, guys. Well, it blows my mind. I know it's not a coincidence. They, they, I mean, they literally just stole the car and basically <laughs> replicated it. But you know, if you go back to our podcast from Louis Vincent gave. He, I mean, I didn't even know this, that China is the largest export of cars in the world. And we never seen a Chinese car here because of obviously tariffs. But the world's changing. and You got to have that global portfolio. Courtney, I gave you this uh, stat specifically because rumor <laughs> has it used to actually work at Abercrombie & Fitch back in your, uh, your college days, right? Oh, high school and college. That was my very first job. And I came out to New York and I still worked there. So, yeah, I'm, I'm an avid uh, Abercrombie & Fitch fan over here. What's more American? You had a Mustang and worked at Abercrombie and Fitch, like, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, like stars and stripes there, Court. But uh, funny, funny enough, uh, Abercrombie and Fitch, which you wouldn't associate with the Magnificent Seven or Nvidia or any of these other hot companies last year, was the biggest winner last year. Uh, the shares soared 285 percent, beating not just the S and P 500 up 24 percent, but the top five performers in the S and P, including Nvidia, which is only up 239 percent from a comparative basis. I had no idea, by the way. Uh, Abercrombie's new product lines, a little different than probably what they marketed back in the day, Court, with now tailored pants, athleisure, long sleeve turtlenecks, 
aimed at a broader older audience targeting uh, customers ranging from 20 to 40 years old. I guess gone are the days of like half naked people uh, that, you know, looked way better looking than I did in college. Yeah, which is it's actually kind of fascinating to me that they're basically targeting to the same people that they used to target, right? I mean, those basically my generation, we were younger and I shopped at Abercrombie in middle school. We're now still shopping there. Actually, I just bought clothes from Abercrombie. It's funny, I bought the tailored pants you mentioned there and their sweater <laughs> um, just recently, which I think is actually really fascinating that they're able to pivot and they definitely had some rough years there. And they're now just rebranding themselves and getting that same target audience they had before. But I think bigger picture what this speaks to is those millennial and Gen Z have money to spend and they are spending. And that's where um, people are really having to be more thoughtful about where they're spending their money right now because inflation is definitely hitting everyone. So we don't just have unlimited funds. And that's where I think retail has been one of the things where you don't have to spend money there. And so a lot of people have been concerned that maybe that isn't going to do so well. But if you're targeting your audience correctly, and Albert probably clearly is there, there's money to be had. And I think that's, that's just a testament to that. That was great insight. You should be on CNBC. Uh, <laughs> that was really good. Well, thanks for coming back. Well, welcome back, Courtney, after uh, maternity leave. Great to have you on the show to start off the great year. Great to be back. It's okay to see you too, Bob and Chris. You know, just okay. I <laughs> uh, hope you enjoyed this episode. Uh, 145 Pain Points of Wealth. If you love our podcast, like our podcast, please give us that five-star rating on iTunes. Leave a comment there. Let people know how great our podcast is. Your enthusiasm gives us the ability to continue to do the podcast. This is Spotify. You can subscribe. If you're watching this on YouTube, you can like this video, subscribe to the channel, click that notification bell to be updated every week for all our new content. That's it for this week. Happy New Year. Stay loose and keep an open mind.